Difference is a social construct used to place people in particular social spaces. It is characterized by made up levels, labels attached to people based on their physical appearance. Because difference is a social construct, it is far more fluid than we often acknowledge. Labels meant to distinguish differences may focus, for example, on differences in gender, race, skin color, or physical disability. Sometimes we are confused by physical characteristics such as those, uh, such as the skin color or facial characteristics of mixed race uh, adults and children, actually. We may not know how to label them, which can lead to an embarrassing stare as we try to figure out where they belong. While on one hand, we have used legislation to minimize the negative impact of our understanding of difference on our social and economic lives, legislation like the Civil Rights Act or the Individuals with Disabilities Act. Today, many states are using legislation to obscure how the meanings attached to differences result in the diversity of life experiences. Uh, for example, there are state actions to ban diversity, equity, and inclusion. Unfortunately, in higher ed institutions as well. And I think Kansas fits into that uh, category. We've also tried to educate about differences in more positive ways through teaching for tolerance and anti-racist education, for example. We use stereotype, stereotyping, known to be a cognitive progress, process to associate group characteristics to an individual. Based on a binary approach to difference, we believe that, that at their core, the other is either smart or not smart, honest or dishonest, to be trusted or not trusted, lazy or industrious. These conclusions are made before we know anything about their beliefs, values, or motivations. Perceptions based on stereotypes seep into our private, professional, and public encounters with the other in both subtle and overt ways and serve as a basis to justify effective reaction to people who are different from ourselves. We feel emboldened to be rude, to ignore them, to ridicule them, or bring about bodily harm in some instances that lead to their demise. Knowing the history and the sensitivity surrounding differences leads some of us to say, oh, I don't see differences. I treat everyone the same. Consider this. By the time young children reach preschool, they not only see racial differences, but some have also already developed racist beliefs. Around age two, children become conscious of the physical differences between boys and girls. Children understand socially constructed gender roles by the ages of two, two or three. By age three, they prefer to play games they think that fit their gender. They may start choosing colors and certain toys that traditionally have been associated more with their assigned gender. They know what is right for them and what is right for those who differ from them. Refusing to acknowledge difference does not mitigate it, nor does it remove the position, power, privilege associated with differences in our society. It does not remove the very varied experiences, both positive and not so positive, that occur in the lives of individuals based on how they are treated because of difference. By the time we are adults, we have not only learned to see differences, but more importantly, we have learned stereotypes associated with these different physical characteristics. We react toward individuals based on this knowledge that often we've not questioned 
or interrogated. As a result, beliefs about differences become second nature to us. It's as if we've developed a shorthand for evaluation of differences that uses very little mental energy as we interact with each other. We, we attend to assign people's categories without any knowledge or attention to the developmental process of self-discovery they have engaged beginning as young children that continues through adulthood. We ascribe collective characteristics associated with a particular group to an individual and in the process, ignore the intersection of social characteristics that go into making an individual who, who, who he, she, or they are, which further complicates differences within the groups we have defined. You can take a breath of relief now, that on differences. Now on caring. I'd like to discuss a few ideas proposed by philosopher and educator Nell Noddings. Nell Noddings was a philosopher and educator whose work on the ethics of caring received a great deal of attention in the 1980s. She proposed that in order for an encounter to be called caring, there must be relations and interactions between two parties. One person is the caregiver, the other is being cared for. Should their intersection, should their interaction continue over time in e on an equal basis, it is possible that the career, the carer and the person cared for uh, may change positions. The relational aspect of caring between interacting individuals is so important that Nottings distinguish between caring for and caring about. In the case of the latter, one can care about someone or something with no interaction. An example of caring about is giving a donation to the Red Cross after a natural disaster has taken place. We feel concern or attach importance to this situation. When we care for, we also feel concern and attach importance to a situation. However, through interaction, we seek to provide for the needs of someone or something. Sometimes an inclination to extend ongoing care can be perceived as a burden. We feel a need to protect or take care of someone or something over time based on our perception of what they need. Nightings explicitly states that caring relations are characterized by engrossment and non-selectivity and non-selective receptivity to the express needs of the cared for. The carer sets aside their personal assumptions and preconceived notions or values of the person cared for. She also states, a great deal of care ethics is a refusal to encode or construct a catalog of principles and rules. One who cares must meet the cared for just as he or she is, as a whole human being with individual needs and interests. Nottings believe that it's, it is human nature to care and to be cared for. Relational care is an approach to caring that emphasizes building and maintaining meaningful relationships between the caregiver and the care recipient. Where relational care exists, a meaningful relationship can develop based on the human need to feel encouraged, to feel appreciated, to feel loved. Both the caregiver and the care recipient want to be seen and known. At the same time, relational care can be short term. At the moment of interaction, however, the carer is totally and non-selectively present. 
The time interval may be brief, but the encounter is total. Based on these ideas about caring, it is difficult for me to see how genuine, genuine caring, caring for can occur in situations where the person who is extending the care is unthinking, superficial, or approaches a caring act with resentment, disrespect, or dislike. I suppose it's, a, it's possible to gauge in the performance of caring through service displays of caring actions. This, while at the core, one is devoid of real interest, attachment, or concern for something or someone. And now I'd like to speak on caring to embrace differences. The act of caring can be transformative for both the carer and the cared for. In the process of caring and being cared for, it is possible to come to know the life experienced by those different from ourselves. It is through this interaction that we begin to tear down foundations meant to sustain divisive and destructive meanings associate and associated reactions attached to difference. We open the door for the possibility of embracing difference that exists as a fact of life. We are, at this moment in our society, so polarized. This state is not caused by the existence of difference, but difference is certainly used to promote it. Some of us believe so staunchly in the construct set up to explain differences that we believe we can tell others how and who they must be, where they belong, and where they should not show up. Embracing differences must begin with an internal conversation with one's self about the basis for disregard of the other. I suspect you will return to the socially constructed beliefs about people that have been promoted over time. And we've had a lifetime to build up the antipathy, indifference, or the need to be better than those who are different from us. I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that you leave campus today and seek out someone different from you and let them know in a very paternalistic way that you are going to care for them. This disingenuous act is performed more to feel good about ourselves than to act as an act to embrace difference in any sustained way. The opportunity to care for will present itself for you in your private, public, and professional lives, with the latter being more probable, probable. We can make the decision to be guided by an ethical care, regardless of the profession we choose. Caring for is not relegated to helping professions. It is just as evident in the doctor who gives full and respectful attention to a single mother and child in the emergency room and foregoes judgment about why the child did not see a private physician earlier, as it is in a civil engineer who convinces his colleagues to set up meetings with a community of families living in poverty before a new highway is built down the middle of their neighborhood. For Nottings, teaching, teachers play a very instrumental role in promoting the ethics of care as they can not only model caring for their students, but they can also model how one embraces differences through caring. A great deal of my time as a teacher educator was spent attempting to quantify diversity, which is based on difference. I attempted to find ways to measure whether future teachers had the disposition, the habit of mind, to address the needs of the diverse student populations many of them would eventually teach. I taught about diversity by providing information on difference. I attempted to change the content of their minds about difference as a means for chasing, change, changing their hearts. The ethics of care should have been more central to my teaching. I'll close with a few comments on the Volkswagen Beetle driver. 
I never knew the young man's name who transported me and my friends to safety on that day after Martin Luther King's assassination. I didn't know anything about him. Given the size of the university, it is likely we passed each other numerous times in the university's hallway, neither he nor I able to recognize each other as co-sojourners for nearly 12 hours in a crowded Volkswagen Beetle. I do know this, that instance of being cared for had a profound impact on my personal, professional, and public life. I only wish there was some way I could let him know how deeply moved I continue to be that he dared to embrace difference on that day and risk personal safety to ensure that a group of distraught students made it home safely. If Nottings is right, being a caregiver impacted his life as well. I hope I've given you something to think about during this short lecture. I hope you recognize the potential power of caring as a means for embracing difference. Thank you for listening. I think that they're, I think they want me to answer questions, if there are any. Yes. You know, one thing about retiring, and it's wonderful, I now wear hearing aids. <laughs> and so I can't hear as well as Melanie will. She asked if you have a copy of it that you could send to her to read. Ah, uh, sure. If you could, um, yeah, we'll get your email address. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. How would you how would you teach care to future teachers if you could come back and teach at Washburn? Whew. <laughs> um, I think through examples and you know teachers, uh, at least K twelve teachers, P twelve teachers spend a lot of time in schools, and I would make it situational. You know, um, one of a, a big problem in schools today is bullying and how teachers go about teaching children about bullying and their role in, in stopping it, really, um, might be a good example. And I would uh, have teachers reflect on their own uh, situations that they, that they experience in school and bring that in and talk about how difference was involved and how we could embrace that difference to uh, make a difference in the situation. I think that is far better than I probably provided teachers with a lot of information. This group does this and this group does that and you know um, what was important to our accrediting bodies was the disposition, the habit of mind of thinking about diversity. But I think we in the education department realized that uh, after a while our students beca became quite savvy and they knew what we wanted, to wanted them to say. And so there was really no way of measuring whether or not they truly had a disposition to interact with differences and maybe the same thing would happen with caring. But if Nottings is right again, she says there's a natural inclination of us wanting to care. And if I could have presented uh, the notion of differences to my students that embracing these differences really is just a very natural thing for you to do as you care for your students, their families, and their communities. Yes. I discovered Nottings um, 
soon after I completed my doctorate, actually, and that was in uh, the 1990s. I was kind of an old student, but, uh, and um, I believe she was a member of my professional organization, so that I, I, I must have seen her speak uh, at times. But um, I certainly became aware of her work probably in the early 1990s. What's the name of the book? The Challenge to Care. Yes. The Challenge to Care. He said yes. that's a book that we need to get back to. Yes, so you're familiar with her work. Yeah. Any other questions? If you're familiar with her personal life, too, I think Nodding's had a bunch of kids. I think that she did a lot of caring with uh, her children, and it makes sense when a philosophy emerges from your everyday experiences. So. Okay.